Welcome to Spiritual Studies Session 25. This is on the goddess and the fall of the goddess throughout history. <clears throat> this is a far-reaching topic. I'm going to touch on many things that require additional research, so pick and choose, cherry-pick all this as you will. I'm covering a large span of history and many different cultures. Uh, in a very summative note, uh, the goddess has been shown to be present in all of the ancient spiritual traditions. And we notice that throughout time, it has lessened and lessened and lessened. So today we're going to investigate that through the Minoans, through the Greeks, through the Celts, through Sumerians, through Native Americans, through the Incans. Um, so stick along, and um, there's definitely plenty to learn along the way. So it begins really with uh, the very beginning of pre-society, really, the Neolithic or the Paleolithic. And we see implications, many architectural uh, sites unveiling figures of women, a predominance of women figures. This seems to imply, as many scholars would say, that monotheism was originally goddess, that the goddess was um, all, was the quintessential form of divinity. We see that this case of digging things up happens all across the world. This influence, as we'll note, goes from the East to Ireland and onward. And in Western civilization or Western society or Western esotericism, we have to acknowledge this root before all roots. So these figures that I'm mentioning, you're digging up these figures with crowns, these figures with certain symbolisms in tow, uh, moons and likewise. Um, in Mesopotamia, you see these figures dating to 6000 BC. In India, you see 3000 BC. Central America, you see 2000 BC. In Egypt, you're finding them 4000 BC. In Japan, uh, the same. And to dial it as far back, right, you're finding this oldest known cave art, which is depicting of such women types, these sacred mothers, uh, 35,000 years ago. And this is an homage to mother nature, regardless of what religious affiliations, right? There is always this outside mother nature conception. And, you know, this has gone by many names, Ishtar, Inanna, Gaia, Aphrodite, so on. So let's start to break this down, right? And so we're talking about the, the Paleolithic pre-agriculture. And we have a series of uh, what we're always told, the society is hunter-gatherer, right? Men hunt women gather. That's what we've inherited and that's what history classes tout. And with women being the original gatherers, this is how we see such an association with women and plants. And most notably, what would later be called witchcraft, the magical understanding of plants predominantly by women. And this would seem very plainly true, right? Um, and in this way, you could say that this sophistication of learning the plants, when they could be planted, where they could be planted, how they could be harvested, which ones to select, this is agriculture. And then the beginnings of agriculture were created by women. And in this too, agriculture necessitates an understanding of when, time, right? When to plant what. And this case of women um, living in a natural setting, 
living amongst each other would synchronize their menstrual cycles with each other and being in nature would synchronize it with the moon itself. And in this way, women were the keepers of time. They intuitively, they had the innate wisdom of knowing when, what this moon means, what, when this next moon will take full shape, when to do things, when to prep for this, when the full moon will be around, and when the full moon would be around would be very advantageous for them all to know, because that would be the best hunting grounds, um, you know, under the full moon's light and to go out at night. And in this, we're, we're seeing how it spells out from here. This is the beginning, right? Um, and, and in this, we start several tropes of symbolism that goes along with the goddess. Uh, I can't explain all of these through and through, but these are the tropes. Um, the, the mo one of the most uh, common in these figurines, these ancient figurines, is the mother goddess um, in the form of a snake or along with a snake or along with the moon, which is already sort of explained, right? Or along with the vulture or along with a spider, etc. Throughout this talk, you'll see that there's several animals that get equated with this goddess. And mind you, when I'm saying goddess, it's, it's one of three things, really. The primordial goddess, which is the foundation of reality to spring from, to be birthed out of. Um, two, uh, the goddess meaning Mother Earth herself, um, the spirit or the totality of where we live, our home, what the earth does or what she does, or three, the more mundane but actual power that a woman, a woman or many women can have in understanding the woo or the nature of things, to be tapped in to what is going on, what is going to happen. We'll, we'll uh, understand this better as we, as we move on. But this first and foremost, this symbol of the snake is something that I've touched on in the course before. It is a representation of death, birth, death, regeneration, the shedding of the skin. The snake hibernates, wakes up, and sheds her skin. And in this way too, the vulture recycles dead flesh. It preys upon what's dead, right? It's almost like um, a representation of regeneration. The moon dies every 28 days and is reborn. All of this mimics a understanding of the reproductive cycle. And this is embodied in the woman. So this is why there was a divineness or a holiness about the woman, was because she is a direct allegory of what nature um, illustrates. And so moon worship uh, before all things was the true religious um, podium in these megalithic times, you know. And although many people would think about Stonehenge being a thing of the stars or the sun, Stonehenge is perfectly created for the moon, that at these very distinct times, that moonlight will line up perfectly between the gaps of the stones, and that this cycle of the moon that takes exactly 18.6 years, the full cycle of the moon is illustrated in the architecture of Stonehenge. So this is, and I've said it many times in the course, but seems to be the OG spirituality, you know, for one women, but because of this, or um, in conjunction with this uh, attention to the moon of this astral body. So <clears throat> in this way too, I want to mention something else. This depiction of Mother Earth and these figurines of mothers in trees. 
And in this old knowledge of things, trees are the medium between Mother Earth and man. Trees are the speaking of Mother Earth. So in what it gives is by the choice of Gaia or by the choice of nature. Um, so it's a language that's being spoken, which this is very foreign to the modern day folk, you know. What is the land saying? If you're a geographer or a botanist, you would be more inclined to understand what is being expressed by the language of nature. Um, anyhow, in addition, these figurines are, are found wearing crowns. Um, so this is the implication to say that perhaps these societies were more matrilineal or the very far out claim of them being matriarchal, which we'll, we'll get to that later. But uh, something that we're gonna see repeated over and over again is this women are the keepers of the hearth. And the hearth is a fire. So women are the keepers of the fire, okay? Um, this trope will be played out through several goddesses throughout time. The hearth was a central place for everyone to gather, whether it was to cook the meat, whether it was to uh, do ritual, communal acts, ceremony, um, they were there, they would keep it. And so it was this kind of maintaining the safety of the people. Um, so in Siberia, you have the Evenke, which is a tribe and the word for shaman is to uh, Utagen, which is, or Utanja, which is literally meaning hearth or hearth or firewoman. And you have uh, the Samoyeds referring to the fire as a uh, literal translation, old grandmother fire, um, or the guardian of the tent, or the Tungus tribe, um, saying that the spirit of the hearth or the fire is the form of a clever old woman. So still in language, this survives to be the truth that the association with the fire is, in, is the woman. And you find this in Greece with these round temples resembling a hearth, um, which are dedicated to Hestia, which we'll touch on later. Um, well, really, I, you know what I'm just going to bring up right now? Hestia literally uh, had the duty by Zeus ordained, which we'll touch on, to feed and maintain the fires of Olympia. Um, and they would cook the food for the gods, all the animal sacrifices for the gods. They would cook everything that was given um, to feed them. So uh, among all of the mortals, she was the chief of all the goddesses because she guarded the fires of Olympus. Ooh. So the other depictions that I want to touch on before we start moving on to actual tribes and so forth and actual uh, religious depictions is that we have a number of animals that are, are represented in women. I've mentioned a few, but there are also cats, cows, birds, doves, lions, scorpions, many of these different animals. All of these in some way will represent the likeness to women and nature, the transience between women and nature. They would be mixed in these symbolic hybrid forms to show how um, natural they were, you know? Um, and horns, this is the other thing. They're depicted holding a horn. You see this in many different modern examples. Um, and it could be interpreted that this horn is a depiction of a fallopian tube, the shape of the uterus and so forth, leading to the fallopian tube. Uh, in these old figurines, uh, if you finding them uh, holding the horn, you'll see that there are inscriptions, 13 different marks on the horn, which is the number of moons in the year, in the moon cycle. And in this uh, old depictions, you see this bird trope, straight away. And what do we see? We see uh, not just in these figurines, but later on we see in the Egyptian Isis depicted with wings and as a bird. 
we see Ishtar and Inanna from the Sumerian and Babylonian mythos having large wings. Again, unity with nature, taking on the natural attributes. <clears throat> so, I want to move straight on and talk about the Hopi. In the Hopi creation story, in the beginning, there was Tawa, the sun god, and Spider Grandmother, who is the earth goddess. And they separate themselves. They, they take a part of themselves and create the earth and its creatures. And there are many details that I'm skipping over here, but they created woman and man from their likeness. Sound familiar? And sang them to life. Um, and then Spider Woman takes the precedent here or Mother Earth. And mind you, I, I'm, uh, this might be my interpretation, but I think it's Spider Woman because it's a reference to the web of life, the web, the cosmic web. And also the eight legs could be analogous to the multifaceted nature. This is the type of symbolism as I'm interpreting it. Um, so Mother Earth, Spider Woman kind of takes over while the sun god chills out in the back and teaches the natives teaches them the roles that they should play, the religious practices that they follow, the ceremonies. And in the Lakota, as I was told by the shaman, there is a story of the grandmother who went to every tribe and told them the songs to sing and gave them each tribe a gift. And the gift given to the Lakota was the drum. And each of these tribes and each of their gifts would share them with one another when they would meet in their communal gatherings, in their sort of uh, barter festivals and so forth. Um, that's an old tale. But <clears throat> right out the gates here, you know, we're talking about the Hopi creation story. And it's involving both masculine and feminine. But it's, it's leading to a more active part on the feminine, that Mother Earth is the more active one. So right there is a hint. And this story is said to very much mirror the Zuni creation myth as well, which, you know, they're, they're not so far away from each other, historically speaking. Um, <clears throat> so in this, she acts as a guide for the creatures in the world and leads them to approach higher worlds. She's a guide. So Mother Earth is a guide to transcendence in this way. And throughout time, the aim is that humans will slowly become more human, that they will become more solid, more realized, and that Spider Grandmother helped the people create everything around them, create the sun, create the moon, um, create places places to travel, um, and so forth. Now, in the Shawnee uh, tradition, in the Shawnee tribe, uh, and I, apologies if I'm butchering any of these names, but Kokan, Kokamthina, Kokamthina, uh, which is K-O-K-U-M-T-H-E-N-A, is depicted as an old woman, which is called our grandmother, and she is the grandmother goddess. You have similar uh, archetypes with other traditions, like the Lakota have the Wabanki, uh, and then you have Paputhkawa, which is this matriarchal uh, figure, which means cloud woman, um, you know, perhaps related to the sky woman of the Iroquois tribes. All of this is just to say that we're noticing this trope of the powerful grandmother or the creator grandmother or the grandmother that gifts. So again, leaning towards the feminine in this way or that the earth is feminine in this way. And in the, in the Lakota, 
you have a more mixed story, but to kind of cherry pick which of the gods I'm referencing here, you have Maka, which is the earth. Um, and that literally is mother earth, Maka. And then you have Wopi, which is the divinity and perfection, uh, the joyfulness in spirit, in archetype, and teaches games, dances, uh, social skills, gives humanity and gifted the Lakota and people with the, the, the usage of the pipe rituals and the ceremonial understanding of tobacco. And that this, again, is gifted, gifted by this feminine entity, whatever you want to call it. Now, in the Tainos people, which are the uh, pre-Columbian people inhabiting the area of Puerto Rico and Cuba and, and onward, they have this goddess Adabi, which is their supreme goddess above all, and was worshipped as the goddess of fertility and water, which that will become a trope we see over and over again. So she can be found in the, in the ocean tides, in the sea, in the streams, in the lakes, um, <clears throat> and can also be understood as what defines matter, all existence, all tangible material, as coming from Adabi or from the primordial goddess, and that there's this nurturing maternal figure. Another in, in the uh, Tainos people is Kagwa, which is literally the representation of the spirit of love. You have another goddess, um, and I'm uh, Guabenke or Guabenki, which is the violent mother of storms volcanoes and earthquakes, another trope that we'll see later, the vengeful goddess. Um, and so you see a number of tropes in the goddess worship that we find here in the Thanos and in the Native American tribes. Uh, the, the trope of the giving, nurturing mother, the mother that um, creates from the primordial to give manifestation um, you have the mother that's associated with the sea. You have the mother that's associated with the sky, wings, right? You have the mother that's associated with safe childbirth, with fertility, mother associated with love, mother associated with storms, violence, and vengeance. And down, we're moving further down now to Peru, and we have Pachamama which some of you might have heard of, but was revered as, yet again, by the, and the people of the Andes, as the Earth Mother and as the Time Mother. And you could interpret this as a fertility goddess, uh, harvesting, embodying the mountains, causing earthquakes, right? And uh, in this, she actually would rule all the cosmological principles. She would rule the moon, the sun, earth, and water, that all these things are nature, which is a weird, uh, an interesting extension, right? To extend nature outside of the planet and into space. Huh? And Pachamama would uh, live on as the primary deity until Christianity would come with its proselytizing. And now Pachamama takes a secondary stance that God is the big head honcho, right? And Pachamama is the one that provides the natural bounty um, for God's sake, basically, ruling under God, you see. And this is that flip of the patriarchy, the flip of the matriarchy. Um, <clears throat> so this has been lost in time, which is a, 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 a trope that we will be seeing over and over again. Now, I'm going to jump officially back, and mind you, I'll pull this all together towards the end, but we have to establish how worldly all these tropes are. I'm jumping over to ancient Sumeria. Um, first, I'm talking about Tiamat. So technically, I'm talking about the Babylonians first, and then we'll talk about the Sumerians. So Tiamat is what would later be made into the Leviathan in, in um in the Old Testament. 
Tiamat is the shining personification of salt water and will also embody the essence of the primordial chaos. Um, <clears throat> so in the primeval or, or in the primitive waters of time, which again, as I've explained in the course before, space is understood as the waters. Um, so in this way, with her being the goddess of salt water, it's an extension into space, far out. It's not just the ocean. And they would say, literally the quote, she who formed all things. Tiamat being the foundation of all things, like the ether. So again, here we're seeing the primordial goddess trope. This word, Tiamat, would come into the Akkadian word, Tamtu which would later move into the Greek word, Tlalete, which would subsequently become a goddess of the sea, which we'll talk about later. But it's just interesting to take this little time here and note that the word Tiamat moved on all the way to these different languages and even into Semitic, which is Hebrew, and would be used in the book of Genesis for the word abyss or the deep you know, the shadow of the form on the, on the edge of the deep or what have you in Genesis 1-2. <clears throat> Tehom is the Semitic term for it. So here we have the symbol of primordial chaos in Tiamat, the original creator goddess that through a marriage of the fresh water and the salt water of the cosmos would create generations and the earth. And it through an act of propaganda actually, by the Babylonians, she would be violently uh, killed and turned into this uh, monstrous embodiment of primordial chaos for uh, Marduk, their god, to slay and to take her body apart and form the earth out of it. And I say this as propaganda because the indications are that she, as a goddess figure, was much more revered and respected and not turned in that light to the Sumerians. But by the time we reach the Babylonians and Hammurabi, Hammurabi makes the change. He switches to that patriarchy where male gods start to reign. And we'll see that as it echoes out throughout history and as it is nowadays. So we can see this first original move from goddess worship and twisting it towards uh, God is the big head honcho. We're seeing it right here with the Babylonians and Hammurabi. And this is done by uh, a, a work of the Babylonians marrying together not just the older reference of Tiamat, but also this other goddess, Namu and Inanna, grouping them all together and create, making them embody the goddess of chaos. An honorary lady, huh? Let's throw it out the door. So first, I'm just going to spend a little time here and talk about how we know that the Sumerians truly were much more about the goddess than the gods, right? And this is by, by mentioning who Namu is. Namu gave birth to An, the sky father, and Ki, the earth mother. So here we have a distinction, a separateness. There is the primordial mother who is the foundation of all things who gives birth to the earth mother, Ki. And when I say Anki, you know, you've got these Sumerian people right away. Oh, Anunnaki. <laughs> but you'll see this mirrored in Greek later. An in Greek would be Kronos and Ki would be Gaia. So this will be a story as it will play out over and over again. But first, we have the OG, the original mother goddess, Namu. And so her influence would accordingly diminish through time. But she was so important to the early Sumerians that they named the third dynasty after her. It's called Ur-Namu. So the, the implications here are many, right? And you'll see that throughout the mythos of, of Sumerian myth that Enki ends up taking over most of her functions. So she was originally very, very important, but you see it kind of dwindle throughout time that she becomes more of a background character as Enki steps up, right? So in these myths, right, you have the creation of human beings. And Enlil 
actually goes to Namu to create the humans. Namu is accredited with creating humans from the image of God. So mind you, again, importance here. The importance is what we're paying attention to. And the other name that I haven't touched on yet is Anana. And Anana is the name that's gotten brought up a lot more in contemporary times. I'm happy to see it. But this is more of that substitute for love, beauty, sex, war, right? In the tribes of North America and the South, right? We, we were seeing how there was the angry, more violent goddess and the loving goddess, right? And here in Anana, you mix them both together. And she was known as the queen of heaven. We would also see analogousness to Aphrodite or to Venus. And in this way, immediately by the Sumerians, she was associated with the planet Venus. And you'd see that she was associated with two symbols heavily, the lion and the eight-pointed star. And like I mentioned before, she's often depicted with wings as well. Here's that trope coming back again, like I mentioned. And the Assyrians actually made her uh, their, their most predominant uh, fit goddess, um, going counteractive to how many of the other cultures were going, making more patriarchy. They made um, Inanna the supreme and, and dethroned Asher or Mordok or however you want to understand the different names for these same gods here. And like I mentioned in the Canaanite talk before, uh, Asherah is mentioned in the Bible as something that God is to be rid of, burn down the Asherah poles. Asherah is literally Aphrodite, is literally Inanna, is literally Ishtar. And that's the other name here that I haven't mentioned. Ishtar is simply a different name for the same goddess, Inanna. Ishtar in the same way associated with lions, right? Uh, uh, worshipped by the ancient Mesopotamians as a symbol of power, right? And in this too, we find all of the same tropes that I mentioned before. Uh, Inanna and the serpent is literally a, a dug up cuneiform tablet and a figurine. Um, Inanna and the serpent. Why the serpent? As I've explained already, Inanna uh, being um, uh, right next to a cat or having cat uh, features involved in her, in her, um, in her carvings. Uh, so in this too, Ishtar, like I mentioned, also being a violent figure as well, Inanna Ishtar, is also uh, depicted as a heavily armed warrior goddess. And of course, lions by her side. Um, and in this too, right away, we see doves. Doves being frequently depicted with Inanna and Ishtar, be, uh, finding the first objects as soon as the third millennium BC. And what do we see in the Virgin Mary? Oh, doves. Hmm, interesting. That might be a lot older than you might assume. And in Syria, you find this uh, temple where you, f you see this giant dove emerging from a palm tree in the temple of Ishtar. So, you know, aside from trying to dissect the symbolism of what the dove means and so forth, right? Like love, beauty, flight towards the divine, uh, the color like the moon, this trope is coming from the original goddess movement. All of these things, the snake, the birds, you know, um, the lions, all of these things are coming from this original movement. This association with Venus and the goddess, this association with the moon and the goddess. And lastly, this association, which you can still find with Inanna and the constellation of Pisces. So there's a lot to unravel here. There's a lot to unravel. But I'm going to move on to give you guys more to think about, right? To show you how widespread this trope really is. And in Orphism, which is sort of like the religion before Greece, or the original Greek religion, you have Anananke. Anananke, hmm. The primordial goddess of necessity, compulsion, and inevitability. She was self-formed from the dawn of creation. And she's depicted as a serpentine, serpentine, 
being with outstretching arms that hold the whole cusp of the universe. Her consort is Kronos, time, and them intertwining on the Orphic egg breaks it and creates the, org uh, the organized and ordered universe. So right away here in Orphism, we're seeing a similar story to the Hopi, right? You have the god and the goddess. I mean, the goddess seems to take on a slightly more active role. And so necessity and time did a dance that created the ordered cosmos. Interesting from a metaphysical perspective. She's depicted as torch-bearing, women of the hearth, and winged. Hmm. <laughs> and like I mentioned before, you know, you had Tiamat, which moved into the term Thalassa, which is literally a primordial goddess as well. Thalassa is the body, the literal sea, the literal ocean, the waters. Thalassa is the waters, the spirit of the waters. Manifestation, like her, her she manifests or is depicted as a woman forming from seawater, rising out. Get some mermaid vibes here. And that she would be the uh, one who births Amphitrite and Poseidon, which would be the king and queens of the sea. So we're talking about what gave birth to Poseidon here, you know? That's how far back we're going. And Thalassa is this matronly woman, right? Sometimes she has crab claws, eh? like the constellation Cancer, seaweed for clothes, a ship's oar in her hands. So again, here we see it again, the trope of the goddess and the sea. So there's a, you know, an elephant in the room here. I have to talk about Gaia. And Gaia has had a resurgence in recent times, you know, with the goddess movement, with neo-paganism, a lot of neo-paganism centering around Gaia worship and this being hearkened to taking care of the earth. And a lot of this is wrapped around global warming, so forth, climate change. But Gaia was the original great mother of all creation, you know, in, in other legends, right? I've mentioned a few already, but I'm saying there's multiple stories and she's one of these early goddesses, or I shouldn't say early, but first goddesses in these different legends. And Gaia has a, a, a rather tumultuous relationship because in, in the classic legend, she gets overthrown. She gets um, kind of crossed and turns into a background character of the whole mythos. And her uh, generosity in this way, in this old understanding, is what would lead her to be taken advantage of which that's rather poetic nowadays, right? And so since she'd be taken advantage of, a mother would be disappointed and a mother would dispense consequences. The angry goddess, you see, this is just like Shiva. You know, in Hinduism, the great destroyer, I'm not getting into Hinduism today, but just like with the, um, the, the pre-Columbian tribe of the, of the Caribbean having the angry goddess that would create earthquakes, you see that with Shiva and you see that here with Gaia. She would create volcanoes, tsunamis, right? She would make famine, extreme weather that would kill people, what have you, for vengeance. This is all the same trope, people, just different names. Oh, so in moving with better alignment with Gaia, you could quell these unpredictable forces of nature. If people live naturally, this is the understanding, if people were truly in tune and they weren't pillaging the land, right? They were respecting the land. Then these unpredictable forces would be nil. So. In the original context, it is believed that Gaia was the inspiration for the oracles at Delphi. And that at the oracles uh, at, at Delphi, you still see the navel stone of the earth. 
That word spoken from the tree-clad mother Gaia was the navel stone of the earth. And so these original oracles the, were women and would declare prophecies by this ancient wisdom that was passed by women. And it's kind of a mix of homage to Gaia and to Demeter and Hecate, which we're going to talk about very briefly here. Demeter is literally Damatera meaning earth, da, matura, mature, mother. So Demeter, in a weird way, is exactly the same thing as Gaia, the earth mother, Demeter. And although people simply think of her as the harvest, the goddess of the harvest, she is also the goddess of sacred law and the cycle of life and death. Central to the Eleusian mysteries. And then over here, we have Hecate. And Hecate is depicted holding a torch, women of the hearth, and a key. Oh, a key between different realms. She was the goddess of crossroads, entryways, magic, witchcraft, knowledge of herbs, poisonous plants, sorcery. And she's depicted in what I get to talk about for the first time here in the triple form. The, the maiden the mother and the crone, the triple form. The, again, the woman being analogous to the, to the moon. The moon waxes, it wanes, right? It waxes, it goes full, and it wanes. The three-formed goddess, the triple goddess. And in the same way, the woman, right? The maiden, the mother, the crone. Huh? So she, in particular, Hecate, would be on the fringes of the polytheism of the Greeks and always in this realm of like, is she a part of it? Is she unconventional? Is she definable? And in all ways, she eluded definition. She was kind of the outsider goddess. And in this too, I have the other ones. You have Selene, which is the goddess of the moon. And in, in, in Rome, she would be called Luna, right? Like a lunatic, right? Uh, and Leto, which is the goddess of uh, modesty and kindness. She would rule over childbirth. Uh, she was wor worshipped very notably by the Minoans on Crete. And so here's what I'm saying. You've got Leto. You've got Selene. You've got Hecate. You've got Demeter. You've got Gaia. You've got Thalassa. You've got um, Ananke. All of these are shattering of what originally was inherited by the Greeks, right? I, the one that I've forgotten was Rhea, Rhea and Sibyl. I mean, Rhea is the, the mother of the gods too. Uh, Sibyl is, um, you know, the mystery goddess. Uh, and what is she riding? She's riding a lion-drawn chariot. <laughs> she actually represented Sybil in particular represented priesthood she was the high priestess and and also translated to be the the mountain mother in all of these different ways you see that these same tropes are spelled out in all the different goddesses in in the greek mythos so what i'm saying is there was a type of shattering a shattering that made them represent it in different places and as we know Greek mythology boiled into patriarchy. So what was the way for that to happen? You shatter the different powers of the goddesses. You put it into different places. And in the Paleolithic, what is inherited in the esotericism would have been one figure, if you understand me correctly. This wouldn't have been all these different goddesses. Um, and if they were, there would have been an intrinsic understanding of what united all of them of the sacred powers of the woman and why these things are associated with the woman. And so in this, I want to talk about the Minoans. And this is really what I've been boiling up to this whole time. The Minoans really set this whole point home. Um, oh, nobody quite knows what the Minoans believe. It's all based of architecture. And, they, and what they are finding is they dig up these uh, depictions of, again, goddesses. The most notable one is this goddess holding two different snakes in her hand. Okay, yeah. What, again, what does the snake represent? Uh, creation, death, regeneration, right? 
And so women on uh, in, in uh, Crete or in the Minoan civilization were the spiritual leaders. There were no priests. They were just spiritual leaders. There wasn't a hierarchy per se. They were just leading. They were in tune with something. They had inherited the tradition. And so in this culture, there are tremendous indicators that it was just a culture of harmony intelligence, innocence, that they were refined. They had amazing architecture. They had everything that they could need. They were rich. They were rich people. And there was indications too of this deep love of nature, beauty, and pacifism, a peaceful lifestyle. Different towns on Crete didn't fight each other. There was no fighting over territory. They coexisted. They assisted each other. They had well-trotted routes between the two. And that this conception of things being matriarchal, right? So let's dissect this a bit. Some academics or people looking into this subject of the truth that the ancient world worshipped the monotheism of the goddess might say that through women ruling over men for so long it was only a matter of time for men to rule over women to to throw a revolution over it but in truth and in the minoans and in the celts as we'll talk about in a second you see that these societies were optimal they were optimal they they did not <laughs> they didn't have wars they didn't have corruption and collusion you know there wasn't these tremendous misunderstandings that a natural power is respected it's not used to rule that's what we're used to we're used to the power ruling over people with all of its corruptness and tyranny, right? And I'm not saying, oh gosh, anyway, I'm gonna move on. So in unveiling the Minoan society, you see that its influence, uh, this influence of the goddess understanding goes from all around the Mediterranean and the Greeks told me themselves, they said, before the Greeks were the Greeks and before they worshiped Zeus in the Pantheon, they worship the goddess. And so in this, that's the old story that this was sprinkled all around the Mediterranean, made its way as far up as Ireland. And um, there was this ancient understanding that has much, that has been put down for a long time. And you know who especially did it. Yeah, yeah, Catholicism, Christianity, which that's a whole nother topic to get into really. But the uh, mutual ideas here is the veneration of mother nature. Where do we get all of our food? Where do we get our home? Where do we get all sensations of beauty? Where do we get all this from? It's mother nature, right? And this belief, this mutual belief amongst all of them of the continuous cycle of birth and death and regeneration, the personification of the mother goddess in all of her forms being a, you know, a pregnant woman or the moon or a vulture or a snake, all of these things are a hint to that afterlife, which is regeneration. You know, uh, I've used the example many times. The tree falls over and nature makes a home out of the log. Mosses, uh, mushrooms, uh, microbials, uh, you know, maggots, what have you the cycle of regeneration that it's all nature it's all nature and that i want to mention in us discussing you know uh so okay let me back up a little bit so you have all these original stories that the creation is shared by a god and a goddess and that the goddess really takes the helm and you have the ones that are just the woman and you have um veneration by say like the sumerians of primarily the goddess 
and then throughout time you see it dissolve and it shift to patriarchy and when um when we see this we we go down the road from the babylonians and we see this especially so in the greeks where all these old ideas still exist in the peripheral but now it's it's patriarchy especially patriarchy right and then you take one step further and then now we have christianity which really got rid of all of those extra notes that i was talking about all of that all of that mythos and then completely stamped it out and all that you have left is the subsidiary character of virgin mary now that's how it went in the religious historical line of these things now in talking about this in a different way i'm going to talk about it in in respect to uh, the astrological ages right so we've talked about the procession of the equinoxes before we're in the age of pisces now right so let's dial it back all the way to the age of cancer right we're talking between um 8600 bc and 6450 bc being the age of cancer and this was the age of the great mother this is when goddess worship ran its course around the world that it was really tried and true and this is a notable mark of the beginning of civilization and agriculture in the domestication of farm animals in nomadic people settling down and i know there's a lot of variants here but we see during this time the mother goddess worship the mother goddess archetype in the near east all around the western world um, and then later on we see the minoans as people that are holding on to this craft after its time so the minoans were between 3000 bc and 1400 bc so they were technically in the age of aries they fell in the age of aries they came um, they came up during the age of taurus and they fell in the age of aries so what is aries aries is masculine aries comes down on people right it rules um and this is perfect tried and true for the age because what decorates this time in history war right the age of aries and so the minoans were really one of these last vestiges one of these last holders of the goddess wisdom that survived throughout time as it was being dissolved in the many ways that i've discussed and although they got completely subsumed in in like swept under the water and swept under the rug per se the celts held on to this for much longer um you know in 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 celtic and you know i'm, I'm mentioning both scottish irish and welsh go goddesses here you know you have Arrhenirod, which is a welsh one goddess fertility rebirth weaving of cosmic time and fate you know representing the cycles of life sound familiar you have uh Kalies bear which again butchering these names the hag the destroyer goddess ruled over disease death you know but was also very wise was also privy to seasonal rites and and uh, weather magic you know depicted as an old gloomy woman you know the crone you have a uh, Carowen or Caredwen, which is the keeper of the cauldron, right? The one who's protecting the fire, agriculture, poetry, music, art, science. Um, come on, people, right? You have Rhiannon, which is the night queen, goddess of the moon, night, death, fertility. You have Sheila Nagig, which is the crone goddess, often depicting the entrance to the womb or to the tomb. I mean, come on. And, and what would overthrow this Celtic goddess worship? Christianity, right? It had survived for however long, and here comes Christianity to wipe out the last vestiges of this old understanding that we had brought with us since pre-society, since the Paleolithic, since the Neolithic, right? Since the Megalithic, right? So, <clears throat> This implication that during such times in the ancient past, that men were viewed as the weaker sex, right? And that they could only be trusted to hunt, you know, to, to flock uh, or to, to, to take in the herds. 
and to not transgress on this matrilineal god or goddesses and this idea that women towered over men in this way and that they deserved what's coming to them right it's only natural that we have patriarchy now natural superiority <laughs> and this is hopefully wrong nowadays you see women in power have to dress in these boxy suits to take on these masculine appearances right and there's a lot of confusion here you know the 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 place of the woman on on the planet what she does better than anyone else right and and um you know in the witch talk we talked about how this old power of of being trusted to create herbal medicines of being trusted with midwifery all got ruined and literally genocided out of existence by the inquisition and by christianity and that really if left to the natural order of things that women would have not the only but a natural leadership in regards to understanding nature there is the feminine mother goddess you know that that nature has a feminine twang to it and so the woo part of woo man ought to be respected it's not gonna lord it ought to be respected in its natural power and in this way the both the beauties of the masculine and the feminine in society if given their proper places their natural places would create almost utopic societies and i'm going to call it right here you know we have discussions in the modern day still still because we still have to face our own humanity which seems to be a huge issue somehow and these conversations of of um race will subsequently and again lead yet a, uh, lead to another discussion on the relationship between masculinity and femininity the all of these separations will become yet again confronted into the cultural mind and until we face this ancient history we start digging up our real roots <clears throat> and we we start to see the genuineness of those roots then this is going to be a never ending yammering so in all of these points here i want to sum up and say that regardless of what religion we're talking about at what point of the world you're going to see these goddess tropes somewhere whether it's by the snake whether it's by the dove whether it's by the birds whether it's by um you know ravens crows the moon um all of these things when you see them will harken back to the paleolithic to our original way of being and that is that nature is all of it and that we need to join in it we don't fight against it we don't rule over each other and rule over nature we participate in it we are it and we need to honor those who are most aligned with it in 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 the the most respectful and measured way okay i'm going to shut up Ha, 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 ha.